So good morning. I'm not Ken Pierpont, am I? So, sorry about that. For those of you who've come specifically to hear him especially, I, I apologize for that. But Ken is ill this morning. Over the weekend, he came down with a pretty serious case of vertigo. So serious, in fact, that he was unable to be standing upright without vomiting. He's been to the hospital. They've taken care of him some, but pray for him to recover soon. I assure you, like you, I'd rather he were here today right now than I. But I'm also pleased that he uh, was willing to call me actually yesterday afternoon and ask if I would fill in for him because of his illness. And of course, I'm willing to do that. When I was pastoring another church a long time ago, uh, the pastor said, you've got to be ready to preach prayer or die at any moment. So hopefully I'm just going to pray and you or preach and you won't die. Seriously, um, last fall, when Pastor Ken was coming to candidate for us, it so happened that on the Sunday before he came to candidate, I preached a message in our church on uh, personal evangelism from John chapter 4. And I was actually scheduled to preach the next Sunday as well, kind of a second part of that message. And instead, we willingly gave up that opportunity and asked Ken to come and candidate, and you all know the outcome to that. We're delighted that he's here. I rejoice in the fact that he's here, such a good preacher. He's loving people, uh, and so we just rejoice in God's goodness to us. But also happens that he kept saying, well, one of these days, I've got to let you preach the second half of that message. And I said, yeah, well, okay, someday, maybe. Uh, but in the, And that's what I'm going to do a little bit of. This is probably less preaching this morning than it is just giving you some tips. I'm going to remind you what I said last fall because I'm sure you've not remembered every point. And by summarizing that quickly, and then I want to give you some tips uh, that actually uh, in God's providence have worked out very well because these, these little tips are actually... Uh, Pastor Ken's own acronym for us. I'll explain more in a moment. But will you pause with me and we'll pray for him and for God to speak even through a short time preparation, me this morning, his humble servant. Lord, you are good. You are always good and we love you. Our hearts ring true with what we've just sung. Lord, show us Christ. He is the one who saves us. He's the one who keeps us. He's one in whom we're presented righteous before you. It's all about you, Lord, and we rejoice in that. Thank you for bringing us Pastor Ken and Lois and his family. What a blessing they already are to us. I pray, touch his body, Lord. Make him well, quickly, we pray. Now, Lord, speak to us even in these few moments this morning, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that has kind of always, I've been a believer since I was 11 years old. I was uh, saved as a child. I was brought up in a Christian home. And uh, while not perfect, I certainly had really good parents who genuinely loved the Lord and loved me. And I was taught from an early age that I should seek to tell others about Jesus. Over the course of a life, there's been various things that make that happen. And some were good and some were maybe a little ill-advised, even if their intentions were good. But the fact remains, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've come to know him in a personal saving way, that's probably the best thing that's ever happened to you in your whole life. Even if you, like me, have married a wonderful lady and have been married a long time and have kids and grandkids, and I hold them way up here, but the best thing that ever happened in my life was to come to know Jesus as Savior. I bet that's true for you. And if you know Jesus as Savior, then you have loved ones and friends, and your heart would be that they would know Jesus as Savior, right? Not because you want to control their life, but because you know how good it is. You know how good God is. 
And you know the deep needs of our hearts are spiritual ones. You know that he has the answer. So it's about Jesus, is it not? Well, I want to share with you, I want to remind you a little bit of what I shared with you last fall, and then I want to give you some tips for personal evangelism. If you have your Bible and you want to open it to John chapter 4, uh, I'm going to summarize that chapter. I'll read portions of it, perhaps, but we need to know the setting. So this is during Jesus, three years of earthly ministry. He's, he's been in Jerusalem having encounters with the Pharisees like he often did. They weren't usually good. They tried to foil him and that never worked out for them until they thought they got him in the end when in fact God fulfilled his great purposes. So Jesus is getting ready to go back to Galilee where he had his home up in Capernaum above the Sea of Galilee right on the top end of that. And he said to his disciples, in the old King, King James Version, he said, I, I must needs go through Samaria. Uh, my version says, now he had to go through Samaria. Well, the truth of the matter is he didn't have to go through Samaria. Jerusalem was down here. Capernaum was up here in the north. And there's a central ridge that runs through Israel and up toward the north it goes into the valley that's really beautiful. And the Sea of Galilee is very beautiful. But there were reasons they didn't go up the ridge. They usually went down the eastern side of the slope out of Jerusalem, down to Jericho, and then up the Jordan Valley, up to the Sea of Galilee. That's the normal route. This time he chose to go right up the spine through Samaria. And I, I would suggest he knew exactly why he was doing that. He went because he knew he was going to meet this woman, and he was going to bring her the good news. So that's the story. It says he had to go through Samaria, and he came to a well, Jacob's well. That means it was built a long time ago, dug a long time ago. And while he was there, a Samaritan woman came, and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Well, that surprised her because she said, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And he said, if you knew the word of God, the gift of God who has asked you for a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. Well, that spurred a conversation where she said, you don't have anything to draw with and how can you give me water? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become a well, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said he wa she wanted some of this water and Jesus then encountered her at her point of need where she was hurting and where she had failed. He said, go call your husband and come back. She confessed she didn't have a husband. And Jesus said, he didn't say, yeah, I know, but he said, no, you're living with a man who's not your husband. You've already had five husbands. Uh, and so what you said is just true. He just acknowledged the truth. He didn't slam her. He just told her the truth. Then she tried to divert the conversation to spiritual matters about a mountain and the spiritual mountain about the Jews and how they worship and the Samaritans and how they worship. And Jesus said, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know what you do, worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are, they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, this struck the woman. and She said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, so she recognized salvation was coming from the Jews. When he comes, we'll explain everything. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, am he. Jesus didn't say that very often. In fact, if you read his encounters with most people, including the Pharisees, he didn't tell them, I am he, straight out. They were to figure it out as he did what he did and as they learned the word. But he spoke to this woman. About that time, the disciples had gone into the town to buy food. They came back and they saw Jesus with a woman. She left. He said, go car her husband. She went and talked to the townspeople and said, I, I've met a man who tells you everything you know about you. And uh, his disciples said, 
give him some food, and Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more, and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the har fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and other reaps, is true. I send you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. I'm going to hear a little bit about that at right at the end of the message. So then it says, many of the Samaritans from that time believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So they came and he stayed more days and many in that town believed. So what I suggested to you last fall was out of that encounter that Jesus had with this woman, we could draw, discern some principles for personal evangelism. What do I mean by personal evangelism? Well, we're talking about one-to-one -one personal encounters with people we know and love and how to share Christ with them, how to share the gospel. It's a tough thing to do often. We're intimidated by it. And there can be ways to do it that we perhaps don't work so well. In your face doesn't usually work all that well, especially anymore. There's got to be better strategies. So look at some things that I tell you quickly about Jesus. You can put those four principles on the screen, guys, if you would. First of all, treat everyone with respect. Jesus treated her respectfully, in spite of knowing her, in spite of knowing her sins, in spite of knowing the fact she'd had five husbands and was living with another man. He didn't put her down. He treated her with respect. Second principle would be this, get to know people well. Now, Jesus, Jesus is God. Jesus is omniscient. He didn't have to take time to get to know this woman. He knew her already. He actually would have known when she was conceived. He, he knew everything about her. So he knew her well. He could talk to her where she lived. He knew what her hurts were. He knew what her thirsts were. He could identify them. So uh, in a book that Philip Yancey wrote on evangelism, he said this to believers. He said, we dare not disdain the choices others have made. Excuse me. Excuse me. I want to pause. I want to say that in a minute. One, one step ahead of myself. The next principle is identify the thirst. Identify the thirst. People are sinners, we know that. And they may be involved in any and all kinds of sin. And often believers can be very hard about that and be condemnatory. And, and certainly we never want to condone sin. We, we do not. We would never condone sin in anyone. We'd never affirm them in their sin. But we don't have to go about browbeating people either because people are lost. They usually don't know that they are so far from God. So this is where Yancey said, and he, he wrote this in a book where he's becoming concerned that too many Christians had lost their spirit of grace toward unbelievers, that they, they're, they'd lost a graciousness of heart and become legalistic and hard and condemning. He said this, we dare not disdain the choices others have made, for that would not show love. Instead, we should tune into the underlying thirst. There is a thirst for God. Most people don't recognize it as such. And those longings that they have, whether it's to get away, whether it's to have more things, whether it's money, whatever it might be, there's something yearning in them that needs fulfilled. And really it's only Jesus who will ultimately fulfill that particular need, but most people don't know that. So unless you can begin to know people well enough to identify their thirst, you may not have the opportunity to share with them the, the one thing that they really need. Finally, Jesus told this woman when she said, we know the Messiah is coming, she said, I am he. It's an incredible statement, and she didn't balk at it. In fact, she went and told the townspeople, haven't I met the one who is to come? So the fourth principle I would say is this. We want to introduce people to Jesus. 
You might tell your story of what he's done for you. In fact, that's a good idea, and I'm going to say more about that in, in just a minute. But they really need Jesus. It's not you that they need, although it's great to be a friend and to be a helper and to do all those things, but they need Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. I do, you do, and they do. And so if you're a believer, you have a passion for that, especially for people you know and love, don't you? You want them to know Jesus. You don't want them to be lost. You don't want their life to be a mess. You want them to know Jesus. Why? So you can control them. Heavens no, because you know how good it is to know Jesus. The final point that I made that day was one that had been as being drilled into me in the last few years, and that is in John, Jesus, uh, he wrote about Jesus that he was full of truth and grace, or grace and truth. You can reverse them. We need to bow the balance of graciousness and truth. We never want to compromise the truth for grace. We never want to be so gracious that we compromise, that we fail to give the truth, and we never want to emphasize truth so much that we fail to be loving and gracious toward others. That's a critical balance. Jesus was full of both. And that was pretty much the message last fall. Had I gone on to preach the second one, it would have been about how does that look in real world practical life? And since Pastor Ken has come, he has shared with us, the elders specifically, uh, a little acronym for ways in which you can do personal evangelism well. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. I ask his permission to do this. He gave it to me, so thank you, Ken. Um, I want to tell you that one of the prayers of the heart of the elders has, has been for our church that we would be better at evangelism. Uh, we have a good church. We love the Lord. We love his word. We do a lot of good things. I'd like to see more people come to know Jesus and to walk with him and follow him. Some do, of course, but I, we'd like to see that happen even more often. So one of the things we talked with Pastor Ken about when he came was, what should be our evangelism strategy? Uh, the very phrase could be problematic because strategy might sound like a program or it might sound like a gimmick. It might even sound somewhat manipulative. And we don't want any of that. What we want is genuineness. How can we genuinely, passionately, caringly share Jesus with others in a way that might lead to them coming to know him as Savior? I care about that. I bet you do if you know and walk with him. So let me give you the acronym that Pastor Ken has brought to us that actually completes this sermon, the second part. And here they are. Pray, love, invite, and gospel conversations. Again, I tell you, there's nothing gimmicky or manipulative about any of this. Our strategy, the elders have agreed, our strategy is we're going to pray for people. We're going to seek to love people genuinely, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And when there are opportunities, we'll invite them to find to places and opportunities to hear Christ, and we'll look forward to having some gospel conversations with them. That's how we want to do evangelism here. So let's talk a moment about how you do that. First of all, I'd suggest you make a list, a handful of people. Who is it in your world, friends, family, acquaintances, co-workers, who, does in your, who is it in your world you long for them to come to know Jesus as Savior? Well, if you haven't done so, write our names down and start, and start praying for them in that regard. Ask the Lord to op open their eyes to his truth, to open their minds to understand the gospel, because only he can do that. Pray about that. Pray diligently and pray often, pray regularly. Secondly, find ways to love them. Love them. 
How do you love them? Well, do nice things for them. Excuse me, be kind to them. Do little random acts of kindness. Invite them to dinner or not, or to lunch, or send them a card. Find various ways to show love, genuine love. Seek to become a friend, to build a relationship that's real, that's not just a, don't put a target on them. People sense they're a target. They don't want to be a target. You don't want to be anybody's target, neither do they. Be a friend, be real. Come to know them, treat them with the respect and dignity that every human being deserves because they're made in the image of God and love them. Those two things are key. Pray for them and love them and keep on doing it. And then look for opportunities to invite them to some gathering, whether it's an actual church service or whether it's a gathering of Christian friends some gathering where they, they might begin to see how real Christians are and how they act and how they live with each other and maybe in, actually hear the gospel and find out what God has done for us to rescue them. Look for those opportunities and do them. And then look too for opportunities to have gospel conversations with them. That's the G, P-L-I-G. Well, what do we mean by gospel conversations? Well, we mean talk sincerely about Jesus, about the gospel. Ken suggests you have two, two gospel conversations ready to use. One is kind of an elevator speech, two minutes. You can say it in passing. Well, what's the gospel? Well, God loves you. He can't send his son to die for you. He paid the debt for your sins. And then he raised from the dead because God accepted that sacrifice. And because if you place your faith in him, you're saved. You have life eternal. That's the gospel very quickly. That's, a very, that's not even a two-minute version. It's a 30-second version. That's the gospel. Then you might have opportunities to have longer conversations. And you have to be deliberate about it. You have to think about it ahead of time. I mean, it's easy to talk about the weather and the sports and how bad the Tigers are and the fact that uh, Lions have never won a Super Bowl or even been there to speak of or all the mess in the world. It's easy to talk about that stuff, but you have to be intentional to seek opportunities to talk to people about the Lord. And you win that opportunity by the P and the L, by praying for them and loving them genuinely. And if you sense that they're not yet ready for an invitation or for the gospel conversation, keep doing the P and the L. Keep praying for them, loving them, and keep looking for opportunities. That's how you do evangelism. That's personal evangelism. Jesus modeled it perfectly. The end result in that case was not only what that woman saved, but Perhaps that whole town, certainly many believed in that whole town and they were saved. And our real hope and prayer and passion for Bethel is that we will see many people come to know the Lord and follow him. Some may choose to join us and be part of our church. Others may go on their way to other things. That's fine, it's kingdom building. But that's what we pray for. I hope your heart is there. If you wanna know what is on the pastor's heart, what the elders care about. That's what we care about the most. We care about doing God's work in God's ways, seeing people follow Jesus. And we wanna follow Jesus and we wanna help others follow Jesus. That's what we wanna do. And that's what it's all about. And I, I wanna thank Pastor Ken for bringing these thoughts. And I wanna say a couple more things and then we're gonna be finished. I'm sure you recognize, as I do, that someone coming to know Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit. Only God can do that. You can't do it. I know people, I'd love to be able to accept, accept the Lord for them. I'd love to pray their prayer and even commit for them, but I can't. They have to do it, and the only thing that will cause them to do it is a change of mind, a change of heart. 
And that's work of the Holy Spirit. And if you treat people in this way, not as a project, not as some gimmicky strategy, but as genuine people made in God's image who need to be respected and loved and look for opportunities to share Jesus with them and ask God to help you, he will. And sometimes, sometimes, he'll even do things in miraculous ways that you didn't have much to do with at all except you were willing and available. And we're going to hear a little t story about something like that in closing from another one of our elders, John Rocky. John had a great encounter this week, or last week, I'm not sure exactly the day, about something that he wants to share with you. And when he does, James will come and close the service. God bless you. Thank you, Neil, for the uh, tremendous reminders of, of uh, how personal evangelism is done. I had the opportunity this week of doing one that was more similar to Jesus, where it was uh, somebody that I had not built a relationship with. On Friday, I had a lady, that uh, young lady from Sam's Club, came to my office by appointment to renew my membership, my business membership. And uh, I knew she was going to be there at 10 o'clock. I knew her first name and her last name. And she came at the appointed time and quickly learned a few things about her. She has a 10-month-old son, and I have a 10-month-old grandson, and their birth dates are just a few days apart. And so we built a little bit of a relationship with that. And she's writing a few things down, and I said, uh, did you know your name is in the Bible? And she looked at me, she said, no. I said, it is, it's in 2 Samuel. Let me look it up, and I'll share it with you. I said, it's spelled a little bit differently. The Bible character, his name is King Toy. Her last name is Toy. So she's, well, that's really cool. This wasn't anything that I had planned, but I felt God's spirit say, ask her about if she's a church-going person. So I said, so Letitia, tell me, are you a church-going kind of person? Are you a Jesus follower? And she looked at me and she said, well, we just started going to church. She didn't answer my question, other than we just started going to church. She said, we're going to Heart of, Heart of the Lakes. And I said, that's great. I am so happy for you. So are you a Jesus-following kind of person? And she looked down to the left, thinking, and she looked back and she said, mm, not yet. I grew up in the church, but I kind of walked away from it. But now with my son in my life, I think it's important that I go and my husband goes to support me. Well, that's great. I'm so happy that you're doing that. Letitia, I know, and I'm not giving all the details. I said, I know you're going to be out in the hot sun this afternoon. If you were to die in the hot sun and stand before God and God said to you, Letitia, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And I got, I got this downward look and she looked at me and she says, I don't know. I said, well, then how does one get to heaven? And she said, well, I try to live a good life. That's interesting, Letitia. How good is good enough? Is it 51, 49, 75, 25, 99, 1? How good does one have to be? She said, I don't know. And I said, the Bible says, for my favorite evangelist, Billy Graham, the Bible says that even my very best works are filthy rags. She goes, wow, I didn't know that. I said, you see, God sent his son to die for us so that we can have a right relationship with him. We want to do good works after we accept Christ. Letitia, would you like to pray and invite Christ into your heart and your life right now? I got the downward look again. And then she looked at me for like maybe five seconds and she said, yes, I would. What do I do? So we led her through the sinner's prayer and uh, she was so excited about it. I said, you may not have had fireworks or stars or anything like that. You may not have experienced any of that. Some people do and some people don't. But you came in here as a stranger doing a sales call. I'm here to tell you that you came a stranger, you're leaving as a sister in Christ. 
She goes, wow, that's really cool. So on those principles for evangelism that you see there, I treated her with respect. We built a little bit of a relationship. I study people. Identified the thirst behind her behavior and introduced her to Jesus. So I followed those four things. It wasn't necessarily the, the PLIG, but it was very similar to what experience Christ had with the Samaritan lady. After she was saying, wow, that's really cool, she said, you know, last night as I was putting my son to bed, I was praying for guidance. I said, Letitia, it's obvious that this was not a sales call. This was a divine appointment for you today. And again, she said, wow, that's really cool. So I've invited her to, to check out Pastor Ken's message on Mother's Day because she said she was seeking guidance. And I said, Pastor's message was strictly about a lady looking for guidance, and you might want to hear that story. I've invited her to Bethel. I'm not trying to take her away from the other church. You know, if they've got relationships and things are built, building there, that's great. But uh, I wanted to share that with you. Um, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. It was the right time in her life. There may have been someone else plant the gospel seeds to her before that she may have re been receptive to that. But um, God was there, and he showed up, and we have a new sister in Christ. So James, uh, come, on, come on up. And, uh, and I do want to, while they're coming, I do want to ask you if you're thinking that good works get you to heaven, how good is good enough? 